years in the dark bro so i know what it is to be in the dark as you come on guys please share this out prescription medications to doctors and bullshit like that don't think there ain't no help out there there's plenty of people out there that'll help you get through this so just pick up the phone man i'm defying all the odds no matter what's against me now There we go. Hello and welcome, everyone. Well, welcome to the No More Heroin Survivor Series. The Survivor Series is an original product of No More Heroin, and we showcase recovery. We celebrate the lives of people in recovery. We celebrate recovery. We celebrate everything today, everything, everything to do with recovery, this gift of life, this gift called recovery. We celebrate it. And on, on this platform, we, uh, we showcase inspirational testimonies of people that have overcome seemingly insurmountable odds to live a life of purpose and destiny. And tonight is no different. We have an amazing guest from, from Illinois, Nick, <laughs> Nick Cialdello. How are you? What's going on, buddy? Um, I just put that on my page. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, doing well, and, brother. You know, we... You're looking well. You're looking well. Yeah, I, I want to. I, I, uh, we we were we were chopping it up before the show and stuff, and I I really enjoy our conversations, and I'm looking forward to continuing this this friendship going forward. You know, the sharing of knowledge, sure. the the, uh, the 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 wisdom that that you have with with the amount of uh, clean time recovery, whatever, whatever term you want to put on it. It's 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 very very exceptional, and you you have a grasp on the concepts of recovery and. The, the thought process is involved. So everybody, please uh, chime in and uh, let us know where, where you're watching from. Throw up some clean dates and uh, let's get this thing rolling. Uh, it's, it's really an honor. Uh, Nick, Nick is part of uh, Never Alone Recovery and uh, we'll get into that later, but he has, you have an ex exceptional, exceptional testimony. You have uh, some, some thoughts on, and, uh, and, uh, the uh, you to, to me you have got a firm grasp on what recovery is about and you're you're armed with the facts about yourself in in your recovery and you can you can help 
you you can help people of all ages with your experience, strength, and hope. So I'm I'm gonna let you take it away. Uh, just t- tell us where you're from. You know what? Take us a walk down memory lane. You know wh- wh- where yeah. it all started and uh, what what you've learned during this process. For sure. Um, you know, and and if anyone's commenting uh, as I'm speaking, when I'm kind of I'll try to catch it and look at my other um, device when I can. Um, and then I'll kind of flow with it if I can catch it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so first off, and I always say this because like, I don't, I'm not big on drug logs, right? I don't, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I just don't care to talk about all the dope and all that stuff. Like, you know, I like to talk about when I think about the disease anyways. So like talking about my past, I think of the disease. I think of the way I thought the feelings, the fears, the, inter- the why I got high is more important than what I got high on, right? Absolutely. And, and so, you know, I mean, I grew up, like I said, I, I'm from uh, the south side of Illinois, not the south side of Chicago. I'm, I'm from the suburbs. Um, you know, I grew up split, right? So my, my uh, family dynamics was my dad was like kind of typical, you know, suburban dad, right? Went to all my games, was always there. Um, didn't have a drug problem. You know what I mean? Like he was very present. He showed me what integrity was. He showed me what a lot of these principles that I try to carry with in my life today. Um, he showed me a lot of those things, but I also, on the other side of the street, you know, my mom, uh, is an addict, right? So, um, at her house, on the other hand, the cops are at the house for domestic violence. You know, by the time I was five years old, I had already seen a missile, you know? Um, so I experienced two different upbringings, right? And, and, and those things were like really prevalent because I remember at a young age uh, seeing the, the way things were at my dad's like, you know, like we would get in trouble for cursing. We'd get in trouble for making up curse words. You know, he was uh, somebody that was very discipline orientated, right? And so, you know, I liked that my mom's. It was relaxed. You know, we could do whatever we wanted. Um, you know, she wouldn't tell me no. And, and I kind of ran with that, you know? Um, and you know, it's crazy is, you know, I, I always remember thinking back and I'm in, I'm somebody that does many forms to work on myself. As I told you earlier, I, I do therapy. I do any angle to better Nick. Uh, I do it, you know, meditation, prayer. I work a program. I do therapy, all of it. I mean, I'm always looking to, to just grab onto something to have it so I can enjoy life more. Cause that's what it comes down to is the more I put into my life, the more freedom I feel. And that's what recovery really is, is freedom. You know, it, it truly is Woo, because, yeah, baby. because like, you know, as an addict, right. I, I never felt that. Right. I remember growing up, um, I felt out of place. You know, I've always had a personality where I can walk into any room with any circle with anybody and I can kind of fit in. Because I, I didn't really, I never was myself, right? And, you know, you had some things. I had a lot of trauma growing up. Trauma is a big part of my story. You know, stuff with my mom, her boyfriend. There was a lot of things that happened. Um, at the ages of 10, 11, and 12, I went through a lot of sexual experiences at a very young age. Those were very traumatic experiences uh, with, you know, other men, other people of the same sex. It, 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 it the craziest thing about those experiences is a, I can talk about them on a video one, but B, I think the craziest thing is how I remember that made me feel like branded. Right. Yes. And a lot of what I did, you know, when I was using and growing up was like, I had so many experiences, you know, later they diagnosed me with post-traumatic stress disorder, but I, I call it, I had this box, right. I had this box in my mind where everything was kind of uh, uh, put in it. Feelings were locked away. Emotions were locked away. Everything was in it. And, you know, when I was uh, uh, 17, I got into a really bad car accident. You know, I I wrecked a car, wrapped it around a tree, caught a felony. My ex-girlfriend and one of my friends got terribly injured. Um, I got, like, my license, everything was broke. But what ended up happening in that was, like, it was so anxiety-filled that like that box shattered, right? And once that happened, my drug use went from like, yeah, I had gone to treatment the first time I was 16 years old, but my drug use was no longer like, you know, I'm getting high and it was like, I need to do this. I have to be high. 
I just cannot, I can't live without using drugs. Like I just couldn't. It had reached that point because when that block, that box kind of broke and I could pinpoint that was the day my life truly changed because from that point on, no longer could I, uh, on my own, at least hide my feelings. No longer could I hide the past. No longer could I hide my childhood. It was all present all day, every single day. And it was like all I thought about for a long time. And so when I thought about these things, I had to get high. I just had to get high because it was the, it was the only thing I found that made it tolerable. It made it tolerable to be in my own skin, you know, like doing dope, doing everything. It made it so I was able to not kill myself. Right. Like, because otherwise it was always like either get high or I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to kill myself. And for me, I've heard this term people talk about all the time. They call it triggers. I don't believe in it. When I get high, when I'm in active addiction, when I'm using the minute my eyes open, I'm triggered. I got to get loaded. That's all I need is to be breathing and have a pulse and I'm getting loaded. I don't need a party or, or, you know, my girlfriend or my, like none of it. I just need to be breathing and being stuck in the madness, being stuck in the obsession and the compulsion to use and really just need to be stuck in that complete self-centered fear. Because when I think about the disease of addiction, I think about self-centered fear. Right. And, and so, like I said, life continued and it, and it, everything progressed. Obviously it just kept getting worse. It did not get any better. I was also somebody who could not main a job and get loaded. Like I couldn't, I couldn't function, man. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I would get fired from McDonald's. Okay. So that was like how good my work ethic was when I was getting loaded is, is I, I couldn't even flip burgers because I wouldn't show up. Or if I did show up, I'd be so high that I wouldn't do the job correctly. But most of the time I just stopped showing up or I got fired. Right. And um, you know, that car accident, like I said, that changed my life. Uh, I got a felony. I got convicted of it. You know, now I'm in the system. And uh, what ended up happening continuously after that point was like, once that happened, I know every time I, every time I started to go on a run, I always got in trouble every time. And, um, and I went in and out of treatment because that was like mandatory. Now I'm on probation after I get, I did some time in jail. I get out. They, they say, you got to go to treatment. I go to treatment. Uh, I get kicked out of one treatment center and then I go to another one and I remember I walked in their doors and I said, you know, how do, how do I get out of your fasting? And mind you, I'd already been to this treatment center. So by this time I'd been in treatment a few times and I said, how do I get out of your fasting? And they said, you know, two weeks, you don't cause any issues. I said, oh, I could probably do that. Like I could, I could probably maintain for two weeks without causing too much of a ruckus. Right. Uh, <laughs> mind you, I, I was getting loaded in there. Uh, I was breaking every rule. They just didn't catch me. And, and by the time they almost caught me, my two weeks was up and they said, you know, I just get out successful by. So I, you know, I kept using, obviously that didn't work for me because I wasn't ready. I wasn't willing. I had no willingness whatsoever. And I had no honesty. I had no ability to really understand the grasp of the degree that my life was controlled by drugs and substances and addiction. Right. And, and so, like I said, I kept getting loaded I, and I started going in and out of treatment. I was like a, a treatment kid. Like I just bing, bing, bing. Treatment jail overdose, treatment jail overdose. It was like, it just was a cycle, man. And I, and I, and I couldn't break it. Or I felt like I couldn't break it. Right. And, and that's mostly what it was. It was like, I felt like I couldn't break it. Right. And, and what ended up happening was, you know, um, now mind you, I tried therapy, but I was getting high. Like we do the sexual stuff. We would talk about the childhood. I'm getting yeah. high. I didn't, as soon as they bring it up, I go, all right, time to go get high, time to go get high, time to get, get you know what I mean? And so, cause I always had excuses. Cause I'm one of those people that believes in the disease of addiction, but I also think using is a choice. Yes. See, it is a disease, but getting high is a choice. The first, second, third, fifth, it's always a choice. It's just, it doesn't feel like a choice at a certain point. Absolutely. But the battle of disease choice, it's like, they're not even the same thing. So it's two answers for two different questions. And people put it like this. It doesn't work that way. Not black and white, is it? No, because using is a byproduct of being an addict. I think there's drug addicts out there that just never picked up, right? And so, they all um, have all the like tendencies said, and the behaviors. Exactly. It's, it's, you know, the mind, the thinking. It's about the thinking. It's, it's my thinking is the problem. The drugs were never my problem. Dope was never my problem. Uh, pills were never my problem. Nick was the problem, right? And so, yeah. from that point on, uh, I, I was uh, uh, 20 years old. 
and I had a kid. So I was 20 years old. My, my son, I, 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 you know, you talked to him earlier and he's in the other room right now, but I, I had a kid and, and I was, I had a healthy dope habit or an unhealthy dope habit, I guess. And so, you know, um, after he was born six days later, I caught a case. So my son was born. He's six days old. Now I'm, I'm in the County again and, and I'm, and I'm fighting, I'm fighting a, a felony uh, of a delivery. And here's the kicker, right? So I'm a smart addict, right? Or I think I am. So when I get busted, I tried robbing this individual. It turns out it was like a confidential informant or a task agent, one of the above. I was really high. I don't remember. And, you know, uh, uh, so I end up telling them, you know, you guys got me on BS. It's not real. It's not really what you wanted. And I remember the cop kind of telling me. So I snitched on myself, essentially, thinking I was so bright. And I was like, I'm going to get out of here tomorrow. And the cop kind of told me, he went, well, it's interesting that you say that. He's like, because the fact that you admit that you sold us BS, there's a felony just for that. So I ended up not getting out in two days. And in fact, now I'm fighting a case. Now I'm locked up. And, and, and at this point, I, I have a kid now. And it's a weird complex where it's like, I want to be a dad. I don't know how to be a dad. I don't even know how to be a human. All I know how to do is get effed up and screw my life up. That's the only thing I knew how to do. And um, I can relate. So I remember... <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there and every time anyone talked about like a kid, it made me think about my kid. It made me think about how I wasn't being a parent and I had this newborn kid and I'm in jail and I'm getting high in jail on a daily basis. Like I can't even stop even because of that. And, and I remember I get out and uh, I go to, I go to treatment and, and then, uh, and it just continues and that happens. And I, I think I went to treatment like, in the last two years I was using, I went to treatment eight times and I went to jail about six. And in that time span was like from when my kid was born, basically, until I got clean. And, you know, eventually I did get clean though. For the first time in my life, uh, I got clean after my ninth treatment stay. I went to, I got, I got out, I got clean. Um, I stayed clean. I didn't change though. So I stayed abstinent for a little bit because I think there's a difference between being abstinent and recovering. And, and I know what it's like to have both. And, and I stayed abstinent for a little bit and I didn't change. And that was the main thing was like, I took some of the suggestions people said to do the easy ones, like pop at a meeting or, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I focused on the drugs too much. That's what it was. Like now after being clean for a little bit, what I really focused on so much was like not getting high that I ended up getting high because I left out the part of this. So right. I focused so much on the drugs that, yeah, I didn't use for a little bit. Yeah, I got involved in my kid's life a little bit, and, and things started changing, and I held a job, actually, but I didn't focus on this. So eventually, since this hadn't changed, I picked up. You know? that, that's proof that the drugs are not the, not the issue. It's, it's our nah. thinking. It's our thinking and our perceptions and how we feel exactly. about it. Exactly. And, and exactly. And, and, you know, and so I remember specifically, and, and this will be kind of me wrapping up the using, and then we can start talking about the real recovery stuff is, uh, you know, I, uh, I was riding bikes with a guy. Okay. I had a revoke license, mind you, because of my car accident. So I was riding bikes with a guy, uh, and we were going somewhere and he wasn't in recovery. He was somebody I'd met in treatment and, and he used, I stayed clean and you know, all that works out. Yes. Um, and I, I was riding bikes with him and, and I told him, I said, Hey man, I want to get drunk. I want to use. And he goes, ah, you always say that, bro. Cause that's what people that are stuck in, in the disease think that, you know what I mean? There's, it's not, they want you to get high, but I think on some level, I know when I hung out with people and I was using, I didn't really want them to necessarily be clean around me. It made me feel like a scumbag. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, he said, you always say that we ride bikes a little bit longer. He's like, man, you always say that. And then I say it a third time, and then I look up, and we're at a liquor store. And I go, well, I guess it's going to be an easy decision right now. And I went in, and I drank. I, gave, I threw away those seven and a half months, and, um, and I used. And I remember, this is what I remember, was when I drank that first sip. Now, I'm a fiend. I'm like a fiend. I'm not, I never was really a drinker, but I had a sip of liquor. And uh, I remember the shame and the guilt just from using. I didn't steal. I didn't manipulate. I didn't do anything morally incorrect to do it. I just got loaded. And I had that taste. I had such a small taste of what freedom from active addiction felt like, the mm. smallest amount, that I knew what it was like to live a better life, that I could no longer get high like I once did. 
And I remember I took a sip and I almost threw up because of how I felt. That shame, that guilt, that everything. And all those fears, everything just came to life. And, and then I, what I did next was I continued to use to bury that feeling. Yes, and yes. I wanted to bury the feeling. I wanted to bury it deep as I could. And so liquor didn't work too well for that long. So, you know, I, I go to what I like. And, and I remember that. This is how what happened, though. I used, the first time I did dope, right, I was locked up the next morning. Literally you, the very first night. You, very you, were first unable night. To, you were unable to use successfully on any level. <laughs> on any level. Any so from, the, from the minute I picked up that drink, less than seven days later, I am back in jail. That was how it went for me. Less than seven days later, it wasn't back to treatment. It was back to jail. And this is what happened, bro. So this is when, the, like, my, I had that little taste of clean. But, like, this is when I started to really start to feel something. And, and the change really started. It was actually, I went to jail. And my lawyer said, you know, you, you're going to prison. And I said, okay. He said, well, shoot for a year. Or no, he said six months to a year, but he's like, probably a year, that's best case scenario. I said, I can do that, right? And so I'm sitting there, 30 days pass, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I go, and they, they come back to me, because I had caught a dope case, and they, and they, they said, uh, my lawyer goes, man, he's like, you really, you really have something that really has got your back once again. So uh, I go back to court and they end up, my lawyer comes back after we discuss like the six months to a year, you know, hopefully. And he goes, you know, they don't have the lab results. You're going home in two days. And so once he told me I was going home in two days, you know, they reinstated my probation because they didn't have the lab results. So the, the case got thrown out. It granted there was the indictment period, but it got thrown out and, and dismissed because they didn't have labs. So this is what happens, though. I, 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 and this was the first time, mind you, I didn't use in jail ever in my entire life. I get out, and all I can fixate on is that I'm going back. They're going to indict me. So I go to retreat for the program that I choose to work today. And the whole time, I'm like, I'm not, my, I had, a, I had a, a sponsor at the time, and he was like, he's like, Nick, you're free, but you don't even know it. Because in my mind, all I was telling him was, like, I'm going to go and get indicted. They're going to bring me back. Uh, is it worth it to stay clean? I'm going to jail. I'm going to prison anyways. And he kept saying that you're, you're free, but you don't even know it. And I didn't understand what that meant. I had no idea what he truly meant. Cause in my head, I said, yeah, like I thought he meant jail free. Like you're out of jail right now, Nick, but you're going to go back. Like, so it was, so what I did was I went to this retreat. I came back, I used right away. Um, and that went on for less than a week. And I remember, so this is where it all changed. This is when I got clean. I remember, uh, I, you know, I shot, I did my thing, and, and, and I remember laying in my bed. Actually, let me explain what happened. I got robbed. Uh, I was going to buy a jab. I got robbed, and then I had a bank account with, like, $30 left in it because I just spent 100 and I said, I need to get something. I'm, I'm in it. I'm in the, the disease is taking over. I still don't quite understand that I have a choice. Um, and so I, uh, I get that last amount of money. I used, I split it because I wasn't driving, so I had to share. And, and I barely <laughs> even got high. I barely even got high, and I remember laying in my bed, right? And I thank God that I got robbed that day because I don't know if I would have got clean had I not because I barely got enough dope that day to actually feel anything. The only thing I felt was the immense amount of shame, the immense amount of guilt, the immense amount of just like you're a scumbag, Nick. You just got out. You're supposed to go to prison. And what did you do instead of, getting your shit together and starting to raise that little two-year-old, you get high. You repeated the you cycle, repeating the re cycle, the insanity. The insanity. And so I'm laying in my bed, right? And I want to kill myself. So that's part of my story. It was like, it was to me, it had gotten to the point where I would have rather killed myself than used. That's where I was at. And so what I ended up doing was I had two thoughts. One was to go steal probably from my mom, <laughs> realistically, as scummy as that sounds, but, probably because it was right there and then go use and or go to sleep and make a call in the morning and reach out for help. And so I ended up doing the latter. I, I went to sleep. I woke up, I made a call, I got involved and, and I, I started my process of recovery. And that was on June 15th of 2015. That was my, that's my clean date. 
Beautiful. Know, Congratulations. Um, how, how old were you at that time? 11 days before I turned 23. That's beautiful. You, you have a milestone. You, know, you have a milestone coming up, don't you? Yeah. My four years is, uh, we celebrate, uh, and I say we, cause it's a we thing. We celebrate four years, uh, June 15th. Actually, Ooh, uh, that, that's amazing. Four years is, is a grip. It's a grip. I, I love, I love your, I love, I love your cup there, bro. <laughs> it's uh, my sons i mean you know I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's true true uh uh single father true single father yeah. right, right 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 here and uh you it, it's a blessing for you to to be able to raise your son today yeah and and that's the crazy part was i got clean right you know i started doing work so the recovery process started the day a, I was honest enough to say that I am a drug addict and I cannot control my life. I had accepted the fact that there was no way that I could control my life and I could not successfully live life without help or I would always use or I'd be miserable Step and I one. didn't want neither. Step one. And then, and then I said I, I found, and I don't talk about my prog program that I choose to work publicly, but I will say I surrendered to that process. And I always say this to people that are new or watching, whether you're going to treatment, whether you just got out of treatment, find a place where you feel like you could be your home, because that's what I did. I found a place where I felt comfortable, even though I was uncomfortable because I was getting off drugs and it was an uncomfortable mess. Mm -hmm. But I remember, I remember I felt this strange feeling of comfortability with the people around me, right? I felt welcome. Nobody wanted me anywhere. When I came into that process, my family didn't want me around. My mom had an insurance policy on me to bury me. My dad mm. had nothing to do with me. My siblings had nothing to do with me. Not because they didn't love me. Not because they didn't like me. Because they didn't want to enable me. And they didn't want to watch me kill myself any longer. Because that's what I chose to do on a daily basis for about 10 years, roughly. And especially the last seven, super heavily. And so, you know, it was just, they protected themselves. Um, before I did, my family, especially like my dad and my siblings, they started getting healthy long before I started getting healthy. They, they really did. They started their process. That's why I'm a huge advocate for family support groups. They started their process of recovery. And eventually I started my process of recovery. Uh-oh, there you are process of recovery after i got into recovery my mom got into recovery right and um and and it's just crazy how that all worked right and, and you know uh it's a beautiful thing because i always tell people like you know with recovery it's not easy it is not easy anyone that tells you it's easy is a damn liar i'm gonna tell you straight up because recovery involves dealing with the things that i've pushed away for a long time that's what recovery talks about. That's what it is to me, is, is starting to deal with these things that at one point drugs helped push away, and then at a certain point they no longer did. Because right. I know me personally, I wanted to, like, I, like, getting high stopped working long before I got clean. Like, it just didn't do the job no more, mm -hmm. right? And so... And so, like I said, my process, and I got involved, and I got involved with service, and I got involved with a process of recovery, and, and I just got connected. I got plugged in, and, you know, I, I look at it like this. You make it a lifestyle. Using drug addiction, being a drug addict, that is a, is a lifestyle. It's a particular lifestyle. It's not a very pleasant lifestyle, but it's a lifestyle nonetheless. Everything mm -hmm. involved with it, you know, and... um so, like, when you can get involved in recovery like a lifestyle, you can make it through death. You can make – like, I made it through death. I know what it's like to sleep on a, a, a floor, but my son had a bed. Because my story goes like this. At three months clean, I had a two-year-old. And then at about four months clean, I had custody of my two-year-old. He's six now. So, like, I grew up in the rooms of, uh, in recovery. My son has never – he couldn't tell you a story of me being high, right? He just knows this – square dad, this lame dad who's always trying to help people and goes to like these places with a bunch of other people. And he, 
you know, my kid, my kid knows more about drug addiction, I feel like, than a lot of drug addicts do, you know? It, it's just because he hears me talking about it all the time and, and recovery and the language and, and everything, you know? He knows about meditation. He knows about a lot of the things that are important to me in my life. And, um, hold on one second. And, uh, you know, and so it's, 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 uh, it's been a beautiful thing. It's been hard, dude. Like, raising a kid on your own, you know, I'm a single, like I said, I'm a single dad and, and uh, I, I, I live on my own, you know, I mean, I have a roommate, but like, you know, I've done it for the most part on my own. And, and I don't get in, like I said, I don't get into the drama part, but I just leave it like that. And, and so like my son has been the greatest thing that I've been able to do in recovery. Yeah. I've helped tons of addicts and I do a lot in my personal program and it's great. And, and it's a beautiful thing. And I'm just a servant. Really. I'm not, it's not even me. It's not my face. It's not this. It's just, I'm doing someone else's work. And I, I believe that's a higher power um Absolutely. work and but the, to raise my kid and 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 all that stuff that has been the greatest thing ever you know because when I got clean man I don't know about you I didn't know how to be a dad I didn't know how to be a human I didn't know how to be anything I just didn't I had no idea how to do that and so when I got clean the one thing I started to do correctly was a I stopped acting like I knew everything and started acting like I knew nothing a that was a big thing B, I started asking questions, and C, I, I became willing to investigate. I wanted to learn as much as I could about it. I wanted to learn as much about recovery as I possibly could. Like, I just, I, I and I have, and I, and, I, and I continue, and it's still, like, it's a learning process, and I'll be learning the rest of my life, and, and like I said, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a beautiful thing, and, and, you know, recovery is, is, the coolest thing about recovery is simply this is like I've made my life like dope. Like I thought I had a dope lifestyle at one point or another. Today right. I have like a real, I have a real dope lifestyle. I've made my lifestyle Legit. in my life. I've made it so dope that dope don't even sound good no more. Right? It's just like even when I deal with the past, even when I had to deal with you know going through my process of recovery, digging up all these things and and dealing with a lot of things. None of it like getting high is not it's just not as good. Like to say that I got a place of my own. I got custody of my kid that I, I am fortunate to work at never alone and, and to be a co-founder of a nonprofit, like the cool things that we do in recovery, the limitless potential, like, man, like it, it's beautiful. And most people aren't willing to give themselves a chance. That's right. Every, everything, like, everything we have is a byproduct of working a program of recovery. Damn right. Damn right. And, and implementing spiritual principles in our living, which, which add yes. value to our existence and our interactions with other people. Right. And, and, and it's like, uh, the more, the more that you, you know, you want to investigate, the more you give yourself a chance. Like I said, you can make your life whatever you want. You know, I don't ever want to be pacing in a basement wondering how I'm going to get another one. I don't ever want to be pacing manically just, what do I got to do? What do I got to do to get one? I don't, I don't want that. You know what I mean? Like I, I love my life today. Even when I don't like it, because sometimes, you know, those insecurities that come to life, those fears, all that stuff. I still, I still am me. So when I got clean, the person you see in front of me, like I, I, I was like a, a wannabe thug, hippie, all this crap. Today I'm Nick. I am just Nick. Even when I don't like Nick, at least I'm still Nick. I carry that with me. I get the freedom to be myself because of the work that I do. That's right. It's all about freedom. Freedom. Freedom, freedom man. Freedom, freedom, freedom of choice. Free, freedom to, to, to pick and choose who you want to associate with, what, what path you want to take in life. Freedom. Freedom. Yeah, it's, it's the freedom of my thoughts. It's the freedom for myself. You know, I, I, a lot of what recovery is is no longer like, like, cause I'll be recovering the rest of my life is no longer being this false sense of control. A lot of like early in recovery in general is letting go of being a victim. I was always a victim. I, I got high because this happened or I got high because that happened or my mom or these things. Was try I always had an excuse, bro. I always had an excuse. And when I started to like move out of the way and realize that I was not a victim of circumstance and I had all the choices in the game that's when A, I started making better choices, but B, I stayed clean and my life got better. That's right. 
I, we, I, I, I shared with you earlier that, that I, I just completed my fifth step again today. Uh, what, 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 what suggestions do you, can you give anyone out there that, that is uh, hesitating, procrastinating, doing, doing their fourth and fifth step? Is it that scary for you in your experience? I've done a couple, um, and no, I mean, like, I mean, it, it really isn't. I mean, you know, uh, uh, if, if we were to bring those into play, like I said, if anything, like nine's more of the boner, I mean, like four and five, <laughs> check this out. You've already lived it. You've already experienced it. Is there some trauma being brought up because you're going through it? Yeah. But you've already experienced the real trauma. Now it's learning to let go of the trauma. Now yes. it's going through it. And, um, I think the most important part is, is getting to the truth of what happened, getting to the truth, because that, that, this, this thinking right here, a lot of those things that were even on that list were distorted and they weren't even 100% the truth of what happened. They were my right. perception that twisted it. And some things I twisted to be much worse than actually happened. And right. other things, what's up, buddy? And other things I, I had <laughs> twisted to, <laughs> bring, him, bring him on with you let's, let, let's hi bro hi buddy i talked to you on the you. phone earlier say what's up guys what's up this right here guys this is recovery that's recovery that's beautiful this right here i don't some of the people that might be watching that don't follow me they always they always see my kid on there and, and yeah i do have him seven days a week but this this is uh this is what it's all about Especially if you got kids and you're using, man, just look at your little man, woman, man, whatever. Look at the kid and realize that if you can't do it for you, a lot of my early on recovery was because of him. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have a better life. I wanted to uh, uh, be a dad. I wanted to give him a shot. And that was a lot of what it what was early on was like he was ma major motivation, if not my biggest motivation to do the things that I did that were necessary to start recovery um, and keep it going, even when it was really hard. You know, I was, I'm one of those addicts. The first six months I was clean, I wanted to get high on a daily basis. I just right. did the work so I didn't. Like, I didn't, like, get clean. I wasn't like, oh, my God, life's great. I was like, no, I want to get loaded, but I, I really don't. So I, re I really don't, so I'm going to do what I got to do so I don't. And then, and then in that process, it went from, like, he was my motivation to – then I became my motivation. Then I, I liked the lifestyle. Then I, I, I grasped onto it and I wanted to continue it. And as far as the, those steps you're talking about, the main thing I can say is, first off, four, you write it as if there's nobody going to read it. That's the most important part of four. Being because, totally honest. Yeah, you're writing it for yourself, right? And it also comes down to this. If you want the freedom that we talk about, that I talk about, it is necessary to do that thing. It is necessary to let go of that past. And if you don't, you'll probably get high again. Or you'll That's continue to act out on character defects until you find yourself in a corner that you can't get out of clean. What he said. What he said. <laughs> what he said. You know? Exactly. What he said. <laughs> and, and, that's a, and that's a lot of what it is. If yeah. you've been... How are those headphones? They're nice. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, and a lot of what it comes down to is you know, if you have like me, the reason why I have such a I, the way my recovery is, is, is a relatively strong program and I'm confident in my program is because of a, the groundwork I laid in early recovery, the foundation, the investigation, the just like, I wanted to soak it in. You know what I mean? Like, give me, feed me, read it. That's good to know, buddy. And, uh, uh, <laughs> you, were, you were hungry for knowledge and, and you really wanted to you find out what the solution was. Uh, I, I want to give a shout out to Shay Sasano. He, 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 he said hello to you. And uh, Shay, oh, Shay, up, brother? Shay's been instrumental in, in my recovery as well. Um, just, just being brutally honest and talking about recovery, you know, in, in a, you know, and, uh, in, in a, a black and white manner with, with, with no sugar coating, you know, yeah. we need, people, we need people like that in our lives. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and Shay, what's up, brother? Uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and it's the truth, you know, because it's like, I always say this and I, I try not to curse as much when I'm on a video, but it's like, dude, to be a drug addict, you gotta be a special kind of effed up. You just gotta be a real special kind of effed yeah. up. You know, I know we like to throw these terms sick and all that stuff. Nah, 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 nah. We just 
We just have help, man. And we need we need a lot of help. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we because, help. because our, our 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 brain works different than everybody else's, you know. And once once that obsession and compulsion start, that would be we. We the blinders go up and we and we want more and more and more and it's it's very hard to find a way out of that and and you you have done that and you've armed yourself with the facts about yourself and the program and surrounded yourself with uh, powerful and knowledgeable knowledge, knowledgeable people and you put yourself in a position to absorb that knowledge and utilize it. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and that's a big part of it, too, is like you said, talking about the circle, surrounding yourself, like who you surround yourself with, you know, it's like, it's crucial, like, A, for an accountability factor, but it's like, for me to, to continue to, like, take on things, it's like, I always never, I never want to be the smartest guy in a room, I never want to be the guy that thinks he knows the most of what's going on in the room, because mm -hmm. that, when that happens, unless I'm the only one in the room, I guess, but, like, <laughs> when that happens, I'm no longer willing, I'm not teachable no more. I have to remain teachable. There's always something I can learn. There's always some information that I don't know. You know, I mean, I would be lying to say that I haven't learned a lot or I don't have a lot of information up here, but there's so much that I don't have information on. There's so much that I can learn. There's so much that I can be taught. And above all, I'm willing to learn. I always am just seeking. That's the thing I was going to say when I talked about the foundation you know, recovery is like a fire, right? So, like, I, I always like to use this analogy when I deal with people that I work with. Um, you know, bye, buddy. I'll see you in a few minutes. All right, love you. And um, <laughs> you're starving. All right, I'll feed you soon. As time. You're just hungry. Go get a granola bar. He wants his second supper. He wants his second dinner. You heard it. He already has one dinner. You heard it. He has one dinner. He wants his second dinner now. He's not starving, guys. I'm not a bad parent. I promise. No. <laughs> We, 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 were on, we were on the phone earlier and he was we had just got done shopping and he was telling me what he was having for supper. And he said, well, I want two suppers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny though. If anyone watching this, that may be struggling. It's like, I couldn't even barely afford a McChicken at one point. Now my kid has the luxury of two suppers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, McChicken was a pricey as a pricey. That was elegant. That was like sushi at one point or another. That's I got beautiful. two McDoubles. Oh, man, you know? And so, um, but yeah, it's like that fire I was talking about. And the one thing that I, I've done, and this is why it is the way it is, is like that foundation I built when I was new, I still have that fire. Like I am always seeking more. And that's, I think, where a lot of people maybe mess up is they stop seeking more. Mm -hmm. they, they get a little bit of time, six months, year, 18 months, even two years. I've seen it, you know, even three years. And they stop seeking. Yeah. Bingo. You stop seeking. The thing about recovery, it's just like getting high. It's on me. It's on me to keep it going. It's on me to keep things fresh. It's on me to take on new information. It's on me to listen to speaker tapes. It's on me to read. It's on me to continue to meditate. It's on me to sponsor people. It's on me to work with mine. It's on me to continue the process. It's on me to go to therapy. It's on me to do everything that I've done for the last just under four years. Something's new. Something's changed. It's evolved as time goes on as it should, but yes. it's on me to keep it going. And it's just like my, like the passion I have for recovery and why I'd like to do the things I do at never alone or the nonprofit or anything or these things is because I know two things in life that I know really well, Reco addiction and recovery. I've learned a lot because of recovery, but I always tell people, it's like when you get involved with the lifestyle and you stay involved, and you continue to be involved and you continue to want to learn more and you stay hungry. And when you get complacent, you recognize it and you get out of it before you get in some real hot water. It'll keep burning. I have to keep putting the logs on. That's reading. That's meditating. These are the logs. Prayer. That's whatever. Even if you don't believe in prayer, don't pray. Try meditation. You don't need a higher power for that. Reading, speaker tapes, learning, doing service, you know, investigating within, finding my truth. Finding the truth on reality, my understanding of that, uh, we call it spiritual awakening, is I'm in touch with my emotions because when I got clean, I didn't have any ability to be in touch with those because I had drowned them out for years. So early on in recovery, like they kind of came back, but not really, not like they did in year two or three or even in the fourth year. Um, 
It's like in touch with my emotions, in touch with you guys, everyone around me, because as an addict, when you're using, you're kind of like a narcissist. So you're definitely not in touch with anyone else's things that are going on. It's all about me. It's all about feeding the disease, you know, and then being in touch with reality. That's the last part, because as an addict, what makes me an addict is I have a perceptual disconnect from reality. I have no, essentially, I have no damn idea what the hell's really going on. That's right. And so when those things are in conjunction with each other, my emotions, other people around me, and then reality, or as close to reality as I can get, let's be real, as close as I can get to that, I'm awake. That's, that's when I am truly at my highest level. You know, my prayer, and I'm not one that's going to ever throw down higher power or anything on that people's throats, because when I got clean, I was a major atheist. Um, is show me the truth. What is the truth? Because as an addict with this perception that gets flawed on a regular basis, on a daily basis, I need to know what the truth is. And I struggle on my own to always see the truth. No matter how long I've been clean, I still struggle. And I need people like you and I need people like other people to show me the truth, especially when I can't see it, especially when it's the truth about me. Because that's what's, that's what's needed to change the most in recovery. Yes, my actions, those are important. My, my attitudes, my beliefs, those are important. But one thing that's super important is to change your view on yourself. Like, that was the main thing I've had to change was, like, how does Nick view Nick? Mm-hmm. Like, am I in touch with what's really going on or am I stuck in the past? Am I in touch with what's really going on or am I, am I thinking about the future? Am I in touch with what's going on right here, right now in the present, that I'm actually a good person who does my best, is flawed, makes mistakes, but picks myself up and keeps moving and I can keep going and going. But am I in touch with all that or am I in touch with my ego? Am I in touch with my flawed perception? Am I in yeah. touch with my fears? Am I in touch with my insecurities? Am I in touch with my traumas? So when I'm in touch with all that bullshit, I'm so far from reality that I'm missing out on what's going on. And then I've now become insane and I've lost my sanity without the use of drugs. Cause I don't need the use of drugs to lose my sanity. I lose that on a regular basis. The beautiful part is having these tools in front of me, having these people in front of me, having this process in front of me that allows me to come back to sanity. It allows me to come back to reality, the truth. That's what it really allows me to do. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, do you do you have any projects you're working on you you want you would you'd like to elaborate on? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, well, first thing I'm, I'm kind of excited. On Monday, I'm going to speak at my high school, so that's pretty, the school I went to when I graduated from. So that's pretty cool. Very um, you know, I, Yeah, it's wild because I'm from a town where there's no drug problem, even though a bunch of kids I went to school with are now dead. But you know, mm. whatever. Who, who, you know, I mean, the denial runs strong, and nicer the town is, I've noticed, and so. Um, I got that. It's coming up. You know, the nonprofit is starting to take off. It's, I, apparently I'm starting to bring it to light publicly. If I'm speaking about it, um, that's, that's coming to light. Um, you know, we're working on that. Uh, I got a lot of things. I work with a lot of the local police out here. So I got some cool, uh, uh, meetings coming up with a lot of different, uh, police stations and, and officers. Cause it's a community thing. Addiction mm-hmm. isn't a family disease. It's an entire community disease. So this Absolutely. disease that affects the whole entire community. Hold on mm-hmm. one second. There's collateral and, um, everywhere. And, uh, you know, and so I got that working on, you know, and you know Austin. Me and him got some other things. Um, I, like Austin. I like Austin. Yeah, shout out to Austin. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, it is. It's like we, we got a lot of different things that we're working on, you know, between placements, between speaking engagements. Um, between the nonprofit, between stuff with the police and the local community going on. Um, there's a lot of cool projects coming up. I mean, the summer looks like it's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be beautiful. And, and hopefully we can really help a lot of people. You know what I mean? And, and, uh, and that's the goal. I mean, how, come, how can we help as many people as we can? You know, how Absolutely. can I be a best servant? Essentially, I'm, a little I'm, man. I'm down for all of that. Hopefully, hopefully our, our paths will cross sometime soon this summer. I'll, yeah. I'll be in Chicago. I'd yeah, love, to be you know able, what? love to be able to hit a meeting and just hang yeah. out a little bit. For sure. We will be, let's do it. Let me know. Let me know when and where. Oh, I got your, I got your number now. I, uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I mean, you, you have, you have a lot of knowledge. You have, again, you have a grasp on your recovery and you, and you convey it well. So, 
thank thank you for doing this. But it's been an honor to have you on here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity, you know, and um, and that you've given me because it's like that's how I like I told you earlier when you were like this is about you and I said no, it's not. This is not about me. Even though I'm speaking, and this is how I generally speak on everything, is it's not really about me. It's really about the still suffering addict. Like Absolutely. whether they're and let me and let me let me finish that. Whether they're using and suffering or they're clean and suffering. See, I think a lot of people only focus on the using addict. The ones that suffer, that are silent, that are clean, are the same ones that if they don't open up and we don't reach out to them just as equally, they become using again. Right? Absolutely. You know, it's not just about detox and treatment. It's about how much can we help, period, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, it's past the detox, past the treatment. It's, uh, it's the entire lifestyle. How do we truly help? How Recovery we is things? a lifestyle. Recovery is a lifestyle. You'll hear me say that a million times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, 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 uh, I always tell people, it's like, get clean and make your life so dope that you'll never want to do dope. And when you want to do dope, your life's so dope that you'll be able to kind of navigate around that. That's right. That's right. You know, avoid all, but all I the... do a... Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. You go ahead. I cut you off. That was I, 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 I forgot, forgot what I was. I was just chiming into what you, you had to say. But um, is there anything you'd like to say in closing? Any encouraging words for anybody out there that's suffer, suffering, maybe on the fence about giving this thing called recovery a, a shot? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if you are, I don't care how old you are, uh, I don't care how young you are, I don't care what drugs you do, it doesn't have to be just heroin. If you're struggling and, and you need help, reach out. I know you run No More Heroin, you know, we at Never Alone, we, we're, I love what you guys do, you know, you, we are both people, I would say, I don't, I don't say reach out to just about anybody, I can right. vouch for myself and my people I work with, and I, I can vouch for Higgy over here, you know, right. if you need help, reach out. You know what I mean? And, and also be selective on who you reach out to. That's yes. important. You know, yes. um, but reach out. You need help. You're worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it. Let me repeat that. Just and, and bring it back. You're worth it. You're worth Even it. when you don't feel like it. Because when I got clean, I hated myself. I wanted to kill myself. I didn't think I was worth anything. But I had this hope that maybe just, I mean, really strangers believed in me before mm-hmm. I believed in me. And their belief in me made me want to keep coming. I was like, oh, well, you know, like, I'm going to do it because they, they believe in me. And they don't even know me. And they right. didn't really care. They didn't even care. They were just like, hey, man, how can we help? And so it's like if you're out there and you need help or you're struggling and, and you're quiet, raise, raise your hand. You know what I mean? Send a message to him. Send a message to me. Uh, 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 my, uh, send a text, a call, whatever. You're worth it. You deserve it. You're not too far gone. If you're breathing and you have a pulse, you can get clean. You can change your life. You can have like me with my kid or like Higgy with whatever, all the things that he's doing. You can have a life of recovery. You can have a life clean. It's not boring. It's amazingly fun. It's awesome. It, 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 it's not boring on my end for sure. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Just got my Six Flags season pass. You know, I, I, I lo- yeah, I love roller coasters. I, I, I like the adrenaline. And so, um, you know, but if you're struggling, reach out. You're worth it. You don't have to believe that statement. Talk to me. Talk to Higgy. Maybe we can help you believe that statement. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Never, never, ever believe that you're alone because you're never, ever alone. Never alone, man. Never. And never. you may die. You may die. Yeah. And, and miss or, that opportunity to live, that, live the life that, that's meant for you. And, or you could, like, to me, honestly, this is my opinion, I would rather die than go back out there and use and lose everything I got. I would rather die than go live in active addiction and, and go through all the pain and suffering that I cause because of choices that I make. I would rather die than go do that. So I'm going to stay clean. I'm going to keep working on myself. I'm going to stay in the side of the street. I'm going to stay free. Because it's beautiful. Freedom from active addiction is the best gift there is. Absolutely. Period. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and this life of recovery is, is for everybody. Anybody. Give it a shot. Give it a, give, give, give it a shot. Give it some time. And the promises will come true. You, you'll reap the benefits of it. You know, some sooner, some later. But you never have to wake up dope sick again. You never have to give another dollar 
to the dope man. You don't have to pay for his gold chains. You don't have to put rims on his car. You don't have to feed his kids. You, you don't have to live in shame, guilt, and remorse anymore. Yeah, you just got to get out the way. That's all. Get out Which the way. And, then you can, get out the way. You can get out the way. <laughs> and when I got clean, check this out. I was so committed to staying clean. I had a revoke license. I had no ability to get places. I networked my ass off. I made connections. I made it. I got around. I rode bikes. I walked. I took Ubers. I did what I had to do. I was beyond willing. I was more willing than most people I deal with, but I was beyond willing. I did what I had to do to get clean. I did what I had to do to stay clean. Getting clean isn't the hard part. Staying clean is the real. That is the real deal. Agreed. You know Agreed. what I mean? Putting the dope down, but keeping the dope down. You know what I mean? And then, and then later on, you start working on that integrity. You start working on, for me, I started working on being respectable, having a sense of integrity, um, carrying myself with some dignity, some grace. You know what I mean? Like all these things that come later on in the process that I had no idea about when I got clean. I just said, man, I shoot dope. How do we, <laughs> yeah, I was like, how do I not do that anymore? Help me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but later, you stay clean and you do all these things. And you have a, I, I mean, dude, like even when my life is hard or it seems hard or I'm miserable, it is, it's better than, you know, being a, like a kind of scum, you know, doing like all that scummy stuff that comes with getting high, you know? Absolutely. And it's just like, that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it is like, I am a good person today. I was not at one point. I was a scumbag. Mm -hmm. I can agree. I can agree. <laughs> agree. You know, even even though, even though we're we're a couple generations apart, our experiences are parallel on on a lot of different levels. Our the way we felt about ourselves, the the trauma issues, the the, the lack of self esteem, uh, the, the the lack of presence of any kind of self esteem, and and, yeah. and not, not feeling like I fit in anywhere, and that I was so uniquely different from everybody else that I was just broken beyond repair. And there's yeah. so many other people out there that felt the same way. So don't ever feel like you're so, so lost and broken that you can't find your way back because it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie that your, our addiction tells us that, that we, we were, we're unworthy. We're broken beyond repair and that it, it'll never happen. That, you know, Look, Nick, we, we were never supposed to have a minute clean and sober in our lives. And look at look look, look at this. Right. Here talking about recovery, giving hope to other people. And uh, there, there's been a lot of people chiming in that, that loved your message. So please, anybody out there, yeah. re reach out to, to No More Heroin. Reach out to me. Reach out to Nick. Reach out to Never Alone. E even if you just want some encouragement, you want some hope, and, and you want yeah. somebody – you you want some some honest truth about what's going on in your life, and you want to find a way out. There there is a solution, there is a way out of this horrible horrible thing that, of addiction. You know, if, even if you're in the throes of addiction, there there is a way out. And and it's it's yeah. not it's not easy, but it's worth it. Yeah. Well, and it's like the whole like I don't uh, you know as you heard me, I didn't agree with triggers. Another one I don't agree with is rock bottom, because my oh, rock bottom is. Death is death. That's why yep. I love interventions because I, I don't, I don't, I, I think that the rock bottom stops when I, there's no rock bottom. I just get cleaner. I keep living until eventually I die. Period. Right. That's it. Rock, the only bottom is either. rock bottom is when you stop digging. Exactly. You know, and it's just like, I choose that date. June 15th was that date. Really June 14th, but June 15th was the day that I could say I was clean for the first day. And, you know, like that was, that was, that's, that's it. It's just like, for me, bottom is death. That's it. When I'm using, it can always get lower until I'm dead. But when I'm clean, like I said, like no matter how hard it gets, no matter all the things that I've been through, um, all the struggles, uh, death, everything you could think of, it's like, as long as I stay clean, the one thing that's guaranteed me is that I make it through these things. I've made it through these things, things that I could never have made through using opportunities in my life that would never have existed had I ever stopped you not stopped using, you know what I mean? It's just like, there's a, a limitless potential, you know, and, and, um, and it's a beautiful thing, guys, reach out, you know, uh, I, I appreciate you having me come on Higgy. Um, you know, uh, 
anyone that's like I said, I don't know if you tag my page or whatever, my personal page or never alone on this, but like, yes, I do a lot of videos. Uh, I know he does a lot, but I do a lot of videos as well. And, you know, check my page out. It's, I've turned my Facebook into just addiction and recovery. It's no opinions, no beliefs, no, well, maybe some beliefs, but no opinions, no political stuff, nothing. We're just talking about addiction and we're talking about recovery. That's it. Said how to, how to find our way out of hell. And how and how to help <laughs> and how to help other people find their way out as well. Uh, so, yeah, Salvatore, I want to throw his comment up here. He says, "When the disease is in control, it controls our thinking, actions, attitudes, and behaviors." That's the story of the unique addict. I can I can't yeah. agree with that. I can't agree with that that statement more. We are not unique. We are we are not alone, and there is a way out. That's the bottom line. Thank you for being here, my friend. And I truly appreciate Thanks it. Uh, look, look forward to our interactions going forward, and uh, just uh, being in, being in, being in communication and uh, being in each other's support network. That that means a lot. So thank you for sure. Hey yeah, everybody, thank you again, Higgy. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you everyone for sharing. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for showing that recovery is real, and that we yeah. can recover. We can recover out loud. And we, we can do it in a manner that doesn't compromise our fellowships and traditions. And that this life in recovery is so worthwhile. And we can have a lot of fun in recovery. Thank you, guys. Please tune in Sunday. I have Brian Reedy from Oaks Recovery on here. He's going to be sharing his experience, strength, and hope with us. And he has an amazing, amazing story as well. Thank you, guys. If you're, if you're struggling, again, please reach out. We're here for you. Good night, everybody. Later. Hold on.